Hi, this is Derek Bermel. I'm the artistic director at the American Composers Orchestra, and I'm so happy to, uh, to introduce these three wonderful guests I have with me today. Uh, I have Hyu Young Kim, principal violin at uh, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. I have Alicia Lawyer, who is the founder and artistic director of the, uh, of the Rocco River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. And I should say that Hyu Young Kim is also the artistic director of St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And we have our very own Wayne Dumain the principal trumpet at ACO, faculty at NYU Steinhardt School, conductor, man of many talents. Um, these are people of many talents. So they are joining me today for the first of uh, two of our new online initiatives. Uh, uh, we're composer to composer talks, which we'll tell you about in a bit, and these professional development webinars. Um, so what we're gonna be doing in these webinars is just dealing with all different kinds of issues that come up in the life of a composer. And, um, and we're going to be joined by experts from the field, uh, in this case, by seasoned orchestra musicians. Can I call you seasoned? Is that OK? That's one way to put it. <laughs> seasoned, spicy, seasoned orchestra musicians, as they talk about their experience with living composers, um, of which there are many, and new orchestral music. So, uh, so hopefully. Uh, some of you joining us are among the living of the composers, and um, we hope to get your questions in the chat. So please uh, send us questions, and also just maybe tell us where you're calling in from. Use the chat to, uh, to communicate with us. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can um, during this session, but, uh, but there's lots of interesting uh, material to cover. And um, so I'm just going to... I'm just going to, I don't know if any of you have so, uh, like an opening statement or uh, a statement of purpose. <laughs> I think we can all talk pretty long then. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let, let me, let me jump right in here. Uh, yeah. we, we have people calling in from all over the country, including uh, um, the great state of Minnesota, I'm supposed to say. Uh, I see someone from Utah. I saw a couple of other places flashing on there, Seattle. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to jump right in here with Wayne Domain. And uh, yes, yes, Wayne Domain. And I'm going to ask you, um, can you share what it's like to prepare a new piece of music uh, or just give us an example of, uh, of some of the challenges? Um, and maybe, maybe walk us through an average day or some, some kind of... Uh, some kind of typical approach that you might take to a new piece. Okay. Um, well, as a musician, um, we are trained, and I teach all my students as at NYU, to be a master of sight reading um, so that whatever's thrown in front of you at any given day, any time, recording sessions, whatever, you'll be able to play that at the drop of a dime. However, um, when you're in an orchestra, and like the American Composers Orchestra, and you're playing music from different composers, probably nine, 10, 11 composers a season. Um, you get the music in advance and you show up to that rehearsal completely prepared. So um, what we do is we get the music uh, from the librarian, they, they mail it to us, and you sit down and you, because in a lot of times there's not recordings for this. So, um, and some of it's completely just absolutely crazy. Um, some of it's not so absolutely crazy, but um, you, you get your pencil out, you mark everything that you can possibly mark. There's mute changes. You make sure that you, you, you're, you're, you're holding a mute when you're playing, that, that that goes in. There's all kinds of different things that, that go into play. Um, and um, what I've done is I, 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 I have all the music that was sent to me in the last 11 years uh, being principal trumpet player of, of ACO. And um, I left the Philip Glass out because that's, that's, that's obvious that that's ridiculously, you know, <laughs> some of the most challenging, you know, two pages of the same rhythm. That's a given. You get a, you get an Wait, 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 wait. So, so hold on right there because um, I'm, I'm sorry that there's somebody drilling right behind me. This is, this is very typical in Brooklyn where I am right now. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about that, Philip Glass. So you said it's very, very difficult to play Philip Glass. Now I know this from experience too, 
uh, and I know Philip's whole big nod thing that he does, but playing in the orchestra, playing Philip's music, why is that so difficult? Um, uh, having the instrument on your face for uh, a good five straight minutes. When I saw the music, I was like, I need an assistant. There's no way. Um, and you guys were very nice in getting me an assistant. And so you mark where that person plays and where I play. Um, because at the end of the symphony number no. nine, there's this big trumpet solo. And it's like, there's no way I'm going to like have anything left if I, you know, play this entire piece. I mean, it, it was, that was one of the most challenging things, even with an assistant to play. Um, and it was an amazing performance, um, I recall. And, um, uh, but so that um, was in Carnegie Hall. I remember that, that. was at Carnegie. And, yeah. And that, so it's like an organ, you have an assistant. Correct. And you just mark where that you know, where your assistant plays, you know, and you, you just, you get a breath of fresh air. You let the Oh, assistant. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you're just going, you know. <laughs> like over and over again. Um, but, um, so I, I have an example of uh, something that I chose. I'm going to see if I'm going to share it with you. Um, let me see. Make sure I'm doing all the right things here. Uh, this is from, this is, and it's pretty simple actually. This is Paul Moravik. Do you remember this, the Overlook Hotel Suite? Oh yeah, I mean, we premiered that. That was also at Carnegie Hall. Yes, it was. Um, and this is fairly simple, but um, you know, when you're looking at this and not hearing the music, um, you just internalize it and you go over and over again, you know, and making sure that there's no questions about what you need to do. So I get that metronome out and go and mark things uh, like this little rhythm here at 148, 149. You want to make sure one, da 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 over and over again. And I'm pretty sure that I did put lines for each beat to make sure that, you know, I'm playing the right thing. Um, and as you see, so this is, it gets a little, you know, this isn't completely crazy with mute changes or anything like that, but, um, can, can I stop you at that first excerpt that you showed? Can you go back there for yeah. once or just the, uh, right yeah, there, right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one right there. So do you, do you prefer a notation where, for example, on that last, I'm getting really nerdy now. Now we're getting into the, the details, but on that last beat, would right. you have rather seen, uh, or would you, would you have rather seen this whole thing notated in a way that showed you the beats, showed you the three, four? um to yeah um because yeah, that would that would in terms of beaming beaming stems together uh like those first two groups would be beamed together somehow right um i like how this is done the second measure uh, 150 is exactly as it should be you can you can see where with the stems where the first beat is uh the, the, the first one is kind of like eh but, um, you know, but it's, it's so different for everyone. And you know what? We're blessed with a phenomenal conductor. You know, uh, he's just incredible. He's so clear and, and concise and will look at you every time you have an entrance. And that makes life a little bit easier, too, with ACO. George um, Manahan, you're talking Yeah, George Manahan. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't say his name. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, nameless. This, this was, this was, you know, this was bracketed properly and, and done in a way that's very, very readable and understandable. Um, and I remember this well, like this little line here. It's all so clear and fun. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, 254 to 255. The mute goes in without, uh, <laughs> without any rest. So, um, and that's some of the things that we deal with with uh, composers uh, who don't understand that you know, to put a mute in, you really shouldn't be playing, but we do anyway. I practice. Uh, can you guys see? You, you, no, I'm presenting, so you can't really see. But I have to put the mute on my bell in front of it to play that lick to get that mute in for 255. So you got to be prepared for little things like that. Uh, that can be annoying, but you just do it. I, I'm not a complainer. I'm just kind of like, it'd be nice. But um, can, you, um, can you go back there for one second again? Yeah. And that, that, that scene, we're not, we don't want to be picking on Paul Marvac, who's a great composer, <laughs> but, but, but that, that second beat right. the, and the third beat, these, the, the sharps, the lack of sharps or what, 
Where are you? What are you talking? What measure? Uh, sorry, 249, 249. Okay. Right, okay. Right. What do you think? Um, I'm, you know, Stravinsky did it all the time. He never put uh, key signatures, just put sharps and flats where he wanted them. And so you just, you, you know, I, yeah, you just deal with it. This is trumpet in C, so, you know. You just know how to, I sing it a lot too. I'm a singer um, at heart, not in front of anybody, but um, that's how I, you know, get through some of these things too when I practice. But, um, you know, that's just, sometimes people just, they forget the key signature. Let's just go note by note and uh, you just get used to it. It's a challenge, but you get used to it. Am I making Fantastic. It? Yeah. Well, this is great to see, to see an actual part and to, for you to talk about your process of, of, uh, of learning that. And um, it's so much fun playing in this orchestra. Like I said, every composer has been different. You know, it's not like playing something you've played, you know, thousands of times, everything is different. Um, and there's all those, those other parts where, you know, they have mutes, and, uh, you know, harm and mute, hand out, hand in, hand out stuff. Uh, it's very challenging and so much fun. So I just wanted to just show you this little example. Um, Do you ever get, is there somebody sitting next to you who, who doesn't have to play? Do you say, can you hold my mute or can you put my mute in? Do you ever do that or they <laughs> no, have to get no, no, extra no. for that? No, you never ask. You never ask for that kind of help. You just do it yourself. Let me stop the share here. All right, cool. Yeah, no, no, you just, you're on your own. I'm always on my own. I, I never, I never bother. Just make sure you bring the right mutes. That's, that's the bad one. <laughs> that's when you, Hey, can I, can I use your mute? But uh, yeah, it's challenging and fun and so much fun. I see Alicia, you're being very, you're being extremely um, efficacious here. You are answering questions. Uh, so thank you for, for answering the questions while we're, while we're doing this, this oh, talk. Cool. Um, I'm just ADD. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. I get it. I've got this uh, here. All right. So you got to be doing something. Well, so let's go right to you. Um, okay. um, tell us about your experience. Rocco has done many, many world premieres. Uh, you play quite often without a conductor, um, sometimes with a conductor. Um, mm -hmm. You now have a concert master uh, who's a regular concert master, Scott St. John. So, um, but you work with certain conductors a lot and um, uh, and so I'm wondering, what tell tell us a little bit about your experience, also from the point of view of being the founder and artistic director of this orchestra. So you're dealing, you're wearing many hats here. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience as 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 an oboist. We met many years ago in in Banff, uh, more years than I care to mention here. But uh, <laughs> but you know. Um, yes. So tell us a little bit about your experience and, and about, you know, just in general and how you approach learning new music, especially as an oboist, but then, you know, zoom out into the larger um, context. Um, I, I see that, that efficacious was commented on by Aaron Houston. I think we should have a surprise word, like the secret word that somebody has to say on these. Um, but yes, um, so as far as oboe, I definitely did a whole lot of contemporary music. I recorded for John Cage and um, got to know him a little bit, and it was a, a really interesting experience back in the, in the 90s. <laughs> but um, when I first founded Roco in 2005, it really was about um, the people that played in it instead of where or what we were playing. And so that automatically leads to living composers because people are in authentic relationships with people that are still living. If you were doing that with people dead, more power to you. But um, well, more fun, I think. You know, <laughs> you can't zoom with Beethoven. <laughs> So, um, but I think the idea was just that it really shifted around season five for us where we started commissioning passionately. And now every concert pretty much has a commission, a uh, world premiere or co-commission with SBCO or ACO. Right now we're doing a lot of co-commissions, which I think is really what we're intending to do. Q and I've talked multiple times about that. And, um, but yeah, just the idea that being in relationship, music of your time, um, being able to really dialogue with the composer and go through experimentation with them. I just think that's phenomenal. Um, composers writing for people and not for instruments is also interesting to me. And I think that's what you love doing, Garrick, as well. So yeah, we just um, started doing a lot of commissions. We have reached, um, we, uh, by the end of this season, 110 world premiere commissions. And that's, <laughs> and that is um, chamber music and, and full orchestra. So 
we have a whole page now dedicated to hearing it because we pay for the rights for um, the musicians for limited pressing every single concert and to publishers. So we've invested millions of dollars in that for the past 15 years. So that's been really fun for, I think, composers because then you actually have a recording to point to, to use, to, um, and, up, and at the end, I'd love to tell you about a project where we're using QR codes to do some fun things. But um, yeah, so do you want me to go through this piece really quick? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Kevin Lau is on here, I know, um, but he is someone we've commissioned twice. He wrote a piece for us for Chamber Group called um, Nightingale. Really a piece, I, you need to check that out too, it's also on our website, um, based on the, the tale of, about the Nightingale, and we have done that multiple times. We even commissioned sketches for that. It was such success that I wanted to commission him again, and we talked to him, and I gave him carte blanche to what, what he wanted to do, and this particular piece was based on a photograph of Chris Hadfield, who is a Canadian astronaut, and it's the picture of his first spacewalk. And so he wanted to write it for the Urhu, the, the Chinese instrument, and it, because he felt like the one string signified the lifeline that the astronaut has to the ship and to Earth and to life. And so there's this minute clip that we're gonna, I, I don't know if we're gonna show you or you're gonna listen to, and then I also have the score pulled up, you can take a look, but this is the time that I think really shows not only the lushness of what he does, but the precariousness of the walk that is going on and the Urhu and how just incredibly vulnerable that particular piece is versus, and when you're gonna get to see your, your lovely friend Joe, well, and if we get to see the video. So Aiden, could you take it away well, for me? Uh, just, oh, I wanted to say the Urhu, just for people who don't know, oh, it's a two string fiddle, uh, Chinese what? fiddle that, that uh, well, We've started yeah. this sharing, so. Uh, but I was just going to say it's two-string fiddle. That's that's you can see that it plays between the strings with the bow. So it's it's very virtuosic and a very specific type of of a bowing technique that's used because one side of the bow hits one side of the string and the other side of the bow hits the other. So hits the other okay. string. Yeah. And you, see, you can see this is our our home venue that it's a Saint John the Divine and it's the whole reason I started this orchestra 15 years ago because it was constructed. It's a long story, but um, that side we don't sit people there because you, nobody can see. But yeah, go ahead and play. You can just, you can, it's just incredible the way it's bending. And, and that's Christopher Roundtree as, as this is his debut with us. But um, that, I just love his orchestration, it's stunning. And it is, it's one string, but the bow is doubled. That's the way it goes. That's why it's the one string tether. So anyway, if you have questions, send them in the chat. But um, that's, that's what I love too. And we also have in tandem with our concerts, a child care music education program called Roco Rooters. And it's for kids 10 and under during that concert the kids had had a music education program before and came in to see that piece specifically. And then they went back for pizza and movies. And then he went down, Andy Lynn is our soloist, went down and demonstrated the Urhu to them. Um, but then, like I said, they stayed for pizza and movies. So parents got a date night after the show. So we save marriages one concert at a time is what I've said. I've said that to Q as well. But, um, but what I think is great is every time our children, the, the Rogue Rooters hear a piece of music, I always select a commission. Always, they always hear the music of their time. So it's really fun. All right, well, score one for composers there. <laughs> um, 
Ter terrific. Well, it's amazing the work that you do down there. Uh, and beautiful piece. Yeah, beautiful, very lush orchestration. Um, I, I, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Q because, you know, uh, there's the, you're also artistic director of your orchestra in addition to being a principal player. And so again, you're wearing the two hats. Uh, but an orchestra with a very different history and um, yet one with a history of doing lots and lots of new music. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about where you put new music on a program and how you approach, even just from the artistic standpoint, commissioning a new piece, bringing that into what you do already. And then of course you often, you rarely play with a conductor. Um, yeah. Only occasionally. Those are great questions. I mean, we we love to foster these relationships with composers, as Alicia talked about and Wayne talked about. And you know, I know you picked this this panel pretty carefully with people who are are really invested in in bringing new music into the world and see the importance of that. Um, certainly, SPCO has always had that history. I think, especially with Dennis Russell Davies, if you go back to the '70s, what he was doing was so far ahead of its time. And we definitely look at that as one of the real you know, high points of the history of the SPCO. I mean, of course, we feel like we're living in a, in a in a really good period right now, but it's kind of continuing that legacy that he started with his relationships with Copeland and John Cage and, and these giants. Um, but, you know, we've, since about, about 2013, I started uh, my dual role with the orchestra then. You know, it's really been steadily moving towards working more without conductor. And that has a really interesting relationship to how you do new music because a lot of times people think well with new music you need to have a conductor and sometimes you do for certain pieces but i think especially when we delve into a new piece of music without conductor that's when we really develop those relationships with the composer with the piece of music you just have to invest in it differently and certainly this year we're trying to do a lot of chamber music uh new music chamber music and even solo pieces so we're fostering that relationship sometimes directly player to player we you know, during the pandemic, we were being really careful with how we use the wind players um, and just, you know, solo pieces for flute or trumpet, especially, or is one direction we're going. And so we've, we've been able to foster some of those direct connections that way. So it's, we're not talking about orchestral music, but, you know, it's still a really good way to keep the, the music going and the creativity going. Um, you know, what fostering these relationships can often happen with a composer in residence, you know, and, and a lot of orchestras have that. Most recently for the SPCO, we had Lembit Beecher as composer in residence. And we, we had this great grant from New Music USA and Music Alive. And they uh, he was there for over two years. And we planned this great festival. And so he helped us bring in other composers and collaborators. Um, we did two of his bigger pieces. One was called Conference of the Birds, uh, which um, is a beautiful piece sort of inspired by this children's book by this Czech, Czech author, about this legend of these birds seeking enlightenment and being led by this one bird. And, and there are all these metaphors about what it's like to be um, an unconducted ensemble and sort of bringing the flock together, but also leadership and, and all these things. And um, it's a really powerful piece. And the, what we struggle with as, as an orchestra sometimes with this unconducted model is that it was never really set up that way. So we weren't founded with this idea, oh, we're gonna be an unconducted orchestra like Orpheus. So we're dealing with challenges of rehearsal time. And so people have to be super prepared before they come, like Wayne was talking about, you know, if we're, we're, we're preparing a program on five or six rehearsals max, you know, and if you're doing a new piece unconducted, that requires everyone to really know the score, prepare in advance. You know, there's no opportunity for a wasted time with this. Uh, Lembet wrote it originally for a group called A Far Cry, which is a great group in Boston that has a completely different kind of rehearsal model. Uh, and so I was leading that piece. Um, and so I was I was quite stressed about how we were going to learn it and the amount of time that we were allotted. And it's hard to go beyond these things with all the union regulations. So, but people really prepared well. And I think that's one thing you'll see across the board, Wayne talked about too. People are, know how you do this. And the efficiency can sometimes be a really beautiful thing. People really know their parts. They learn the score beforehand and they come with this sense of responsibility and they want to really make the best performance. Um, but you really have to get into the music and especially if you want to bring out that storytelling aspect, you kind of have to understand and having the composer there to, to, to work on with that uh, piece was especially great with Lembitz. And we, we have the whole piece in our concert library uh, where you can watch the whole performance and it's a, it's a really beautiful piece. I thought, you know, uh, as we were leading up to this uh, webinar, you, you were asking about different techniques. 
And sometimes it's it's a little we're always worried as orchestral players to like give too many ideas to to composers about what they can experiment with. But you know, I think when you ha when your imagination is really running wild, which is great, we encourage that. You know, as if there's a sort of idea behind it and you can describe that imagery and then you have a chance to work with the musicians, it can be really magical. And I, I picked this one specific spot in Conference of the Birds that I thought was a, an interesting technique, which was, you know, and it, it and when you have different string players doing it, you know, it creates a different effect. So, you know, if you if you're not really pressing the strings down completely, but then you do this glissando So it's a combination of white noise and pitch and glissandi. And so when I do it by myself, it doesn't really sound like much and Zoom is terrible. But um, I'll just show you what it looks like in the score if I just share my screen quickly. Um, oh no, I didn't do this right, oh, here it is. If you can see this, so you see this kind of effect in the in the violin parts where he describes it as on the G string, half pressure with left hand and close to the bridge, 90% white noise, 10% pitch, and Euclid. And it, he gives this, this uh, direction in the tempo marking as well. This is the opening of the second movement. And it creates this really hypnotic, beautiful effect that you feel like you're maybe one of these birds is part of the flock and, and just going. And, and then there are others who are playing pitched and then non pitched. And so I just wanted to show this one example of how you know Lemba was really able to create this picture and by you know all the interaction that we were able to have with him as a composer in residence that I think he created real meaning and sort of this is a really beautiful part of this piece and maybe he's also split all the string all the strings so you hear all the violins there right and yeah I mean, you're hearing everybody play individual parts which itself creates some issues with the making of parts uh yeah. and everybody reading off their own part um on the stand, right? That has its own issues. Yeah, so there are 18 separate string parts. You can see the, the way it's mapped out there. And he, he wrote it specifically for a Far Cry, which has 18 members, so. Um, but yeah, and then maybe we can go to the video now of this section, Aiden can play this. Maybe I have to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, so you just get a sense of that of that effect when all the strings are doing that. Um, there, there's another just little story with this process of learning the piece and, and rehearsing it, where, you know, especially in the beginning where it's a little bit more aleatory, it's all written out, but there's a lot of seagull sounds and it's before the birds really take off. I was, I was doing a lot of, I was doing a little bit of conducting with my, with my hand. You know, and then Lemba came up to me at, like, after the after the first few rehearsals we really got in, we didn't really need that. So I did a little bit with the scroll, but we had a conversation. It really was, uh, and I think I was nervous about doing it for video, live performance and those things, but he convinced me to let it go and just like trust the group. And just, you know, it's better to have that sense of, there's not a, like a secret to how you're keeping it together, but instead to really just go with that that freedom. And so, and I think when that happens, it's like a beautiful thing. And especially to be able to do that with new music, you really want to treat it as, as if it's something that you've lived with and experienced. You know, it, it's very hard to do if, if an orchestra just rehearses it twice, you know, like for 20 minutes each and then performs it. And so we, we're all looking for that deeper experience, I think, with new music and giving it pride of place in a program uh, and really let it, letting that inform what you play from the past with that. I think that's really the, a good starting point is like, how do you want to feature this piece and what can it lead to? I mean, we we have a program this weekend that we're doing for our next live stream where the, the inspiration for the piece was really this, this, it's not a long piece, but Billy Child's quartet called Unrequited. 
that we just fell in love with. And it was just like, it was a way to build around that. So we have Brahms Carnet Quintet and Clara Schumann and a piece by Def with Pale Store too. But sometimes it's like the little, it, it's a shorter new piece that really informs the whole program. Wow. No. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love about, I was just going to say about all these orchestras is that they all put a lot of time into their, into rehearsing the new work, especially. And, um, I think is something that is unusual because usually it gets crammed in, um, to too little rehearsal. And so, uh, so, so the, the, the new work is kind of scrambling for attention, um, compared to the Strauss or, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Well, I know that Wayne had mentioned this to us too, that all of us in these groups, we provide the score to every musician, you know, that all the musicians have access to the scores during rehearsal beforehand ahead of time, just knowing what each other has that it's, it's, you're not, you're not in your little bubble type thing, even though it's a good bubble if you had COVID testing, but um, you're not in your little individual bubble. And I think that's what's really special about all these groups too, is that everybody takes responsibility to know what the bass double bass has keep referring to that Wayne and I did. I did have, forget to scare, scare, to share the score of Kevin's piece, if you don't mind, just very briefly, it's two pages to show, somebody was asking what the Urhu had looked like. Do you mind, Wayne? I know you want to comment. Sure. Let me show you this for a second. So here's the, um, here's the parts right up before you get to the Urhu part. And I'll just keep scrolling because if you're down in the bottom, you can't really see it very well. So really it's just notated straight on a treble clef. I mean, it's not anything strange. And then the slides that you see happening, I can get to in just a second. But um, it's amazing. You can hit those beautiful pitches with just that one, one string. Um, let me show you down here the, the pitch bends that happen. But you've probably already seen some of the bends. So this is what's happening even with the tremolo. And um, right. so that, I thought that was interesting. Anyway, I just wanted to show that to you. No, it's, it's incredible because Erhu has a notation that is fully Western. And then there are other notations that more the, the traditional players would read in China, uh, which is a system of numbers and, you know, that refer to fingerings and strings. Right. And so, uh, so a lot of the gr great players actually know how to read both, uh, although many will just read the traditional notation, but, but more and more, a lot of, a lot of players are coming out that can either read the traditional or this kind of westernized notation. I had an interesting experience a few years ago when I was judging a competition for Chinese orchestra using all Chinese instruments uh, in Taipei. And it was, uh, it was just incredible to see the, not only this group of instruments, but the way they were notated, um, which actually in its own way corresponded very much to a Western orchestra, uh, but most of them being monophonic and, uh, and having the, uh, well, I think the most interesting thing was how they supplemented them sometimes with Western instruments, especially in the bass register, because they're, because they're the, the, the orchestras there of traditional instruments don't have bass, uh, such a heavy bass section. And so I think they were trying to supplement to make it sound a little more like a Western orchestra. Um, so there are some interesting questions in the chat going through and, uh, and so uh, one, one of the questions that came through was about writing for voice and orchestra. And I wanted to throw that back to you all to ask about specific experiences you had with, um, with vocal works and singers um, being more or less inclined towards new music. And there are, I think, you know, there, I, my answer to that would actually just be that, well, you got to work with a singer who really wants to engage with new music. And there are many of them but there are many that are not as interested in new music. So it's, it's, it's hard to count on the orchestra finding a singer, you know, having a singer who's doing a random program, uh, maybe with songs by Strauss. I keep saying Strauss, I don't know okay. why I've got Strauss on the brain, but, but you know, that would necessarily want to do new music. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, I so anyway. Yeah. I think what most of us probably, and Kate and Wayne, you can speak to it, is that we have these pieces being written for people. So one of the ones we did last year was Lisa Bialava's work that was for, it was Hidden Women's Voices, and it was for the blind soprano Lori Rubin. And so that was specifically for her, and they've had a relationship before they came to us, which is ideal, right? So I think, Q, I'm sure you all have some things like that too, that's really written for a specific singer 
or when you commission it, you have a singer in mind as opposed to just commissioning a piece and then hiring a singer. That, I would never do that, just saying. Um, never would I do that. Other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. No, go ahead, Wayne. I, I was just going to say, you know, with ACO, a lot of, uh, there's been composers who have written, like Melissa Peronosic, per, per, how do you pronounce her last name? Yeah. Peronosic, yeah. Yeah, not sure. She wrote a piece for her to sing. Right. You know, and, and, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, you know, that's as opposed to having someone else in mind. Too. Yeah, I don't know if you remember when we worked with uh, Shara Nova, and she uh, she sang uh, the Wild Seven Deadly Sins, and then she sang her own songs uh, and some songs by Sarah Kirkland Snyder, uh, which which was an interesting pairing because having having a singer who is comfortable doing uh, more standard work, although an unusual work by Kurt Weill, and then uh, pairing that with with a couple of new works, um, but again written very much for their specific voice, which I think is what makes the difference. Q, did you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting example. I, I, I do think with a singer especially, it has, it's great if the project emanates from the singer itself in terms of, oh, I really want to do this piece and is this orchestra interested in doing it? I think that's, that's going to be the most successful. But also it makes me think a little bit more about how, um, you know, having performers who are composing for themselves, I think is, is something really, is a direction that I think we're going to see more of. And Derek, I know you, you write for yourself, but you also write for others, but um, I hope more people do it. I think, especially with singing, I think it can be really meaningful. And I think we're all starting to become more open to this idea that composer doesn't have to be a separate category altogether. And it can be, you know, the, the lines can be blurred and, you know, I, I'm almost afraid to say it, but, you know, I'm trying to compose now. I never did before, but I think this quarantine is making everyone say, well, how can I be more creative? I have to do something, you know? So, like, even writing a song for me and my daughter or something or for me and my wife, you know, like, it, it's just not that I would do it in public, but, like, I think we're all kind of thinking, how can we be more connected and more creative, you know? And, and orchestras are full of creative people, too, but sometimes they think, oh, I'm going to do it you know, it's, it's on the side, it's not part of my job. And so that, that will be beautiful when it's actually coming into the workplace and people are being more creative in the workplace. One of the scariest things we ever did at SBCO was to do this group improvisation with Taishan Sori. Um, and it was- Oh, conduction. His conduction, yeah. Oh. He, his, he called it autoscodizons. He was uh, fiddling around with a different terminology. Um, but it, you know, the most, satisfying incarnation of that was when we did it for an open rehearsal and somehow it was like the first time he brought out this one technique of like writing things on cards and then showing it to us and then people would go in different directions and it was like a 45 minute group improvisation that just really came together and was people were listening in different ways and it's exciting i don't know for the audience it's harder sometimes but but we all have creative outlets i think one of the pieces we did um two years ago we i commissioned a piece based on the life of a punk rocker here in Houston. He's famous for his huge red mohawk he rides around on a moped and he had some cancer. So we all in the whole city surrounded him and I commissioned Dan Visconti to write a piece and he basically make it, made it an aleatory, interesting, improvisatory, kind of approaching what punk was in its time. And it's called, his group is called The Hates and they're the first that ever existed. And Anyway, so he had this incredible, that was very challenging too, because we had this thing across the orchestra, you can go see the video of us going shh and trying to time that, and it was without a conductor, and then all of, all of the aleatory and then some improvisatory things without a conductor. I mean, Scott was gyrating all over the place, but, um, but it turned out really interesting. And then one, one piece was written by a jazz guy who I required the orchestra to sing, and I thought it was going to be really jazzy and, and, and fun, but it turned out to be incredibly complicated and down were sevens and upper tritones. And anyway, but it's, it's, you know, I think that's what's fun about this exploration of potentially fa failing and failing well. Well, Beckett said, fail again, fail better. You that's know, what that's what we do as composers. But I, uh, but I noticed we have our, um, uh, there's big Minnesota representation here. And we have the uh, Vanessa Rose from the uh, American Composers Forum with us. And they are a wonderful uh, 
uh, composer, um, composer centered organization, service organization that, that does a lot for composers. And they've been, they're sponsoring all of these um, professional development workshops, which we're going to be doing right down the line uh, through January, just like this one is. So, uh, so please tune in just like you're tuned in here, please tune in in the next, uh, next few months as we explore almost every aspect of orchestral uh, shenanigans, whatever they may be, publishing, um, you know, making parts, uh, marketing, uh, recording, all kinds of things. And, and so we, we really hope that you'll join us and continue to ask questions as you are doing here. We want to hit we want to hit more of these, more of these questions. Um, oh, some of them are just thank yous. But um, hey, I wanted to ask everybody, what's going on right now? I mean, Q made reference to that we're in this pandemic. Um, you know, we're at home going cuckoo. Uh, maybe we're we're even driven to the point of composing. Uh, but what what are you doing during this period? And um, what is this period? Is it a kind of a reset? Is it, uh, is it making you think about uh, other things but, uh, besides all the different things going on in our country with racial justice, um, you know, the election coming up, but, but we, we also are in the middle of a pandemic. It's kind of a stop for artists. People have just stopped working and won't start again in all likelihood. I mean, we're, we're still hoping to do our April concerts, but uh, if not, then we're going to be, you know, dark through maybe the uh, the summer. And so, what is that doing? I personally really miss performing and hearing an audience clap when you're done. Um, you know, that that whole aspect. Even when you're playing on Broadway, even if I'm playing a quintet concert, that whole aspect, I really, really miss it. Teaching is great. I love teaching. Um, but before teaching really kicked in in September. Um, I was preparing for my personal brass quintet. I, I have all these Busoni pieces for piano. I had the time to, to make arrangements for our quintet. So I have a whole concert that I've arranged of music for whenever we set something up, because when it comes back, we're going to go full speed ahead. We're going to create opportunities and concerts and aid in having everything get back to normal. So uh, I have something set up for our quintet already. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing. And I'm staying away from media. Media is really depressing me. It, and it really, it makes me angry. I get tired of going on Facebook and, and having someone go off on that person because he said that. I'm like, I'm done. I know who I'm voting for. I don't need to hear anything about what this person said and that person said. And I'm happier. You know, I'm just so, you know. The only day you should go on Facebook is your birthday. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's the, that's the end of the day. Then just and that's right today, back Derek. There. Happy birthday today, Derek. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, see, I was fishing. I was fishing. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but what? there was in the summer. I had a lot of time to do things that I didn't have the time to do. Uh, if I, you know, were running out and commuting, you know, it's it's been really interesting. <laughs> Alicia, you you were about to say something. Yeah, just um. um it was silly. I, I have an applause app that I use that you can just, <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, you might as well bring your own, but no, um, yeah, just, we actually, we, we opened our, we opened our season last, last weekend and, you know, it was the full 40 piece orchestra. We went through massive COVID testing and we played an outdoor theater, which was really great and live streamed from there. And this whole season, we've committed to no in-person audiences and all free live streams, all free content digitally. So um, it's it's working. I mean, it was a lot of work and we did a virtual gala where we delivered 256 meals to people. It was insane. Um, but I think it's just really going to, I think it's going to shake up the field in a way that really is going to show what we are capable of. I mean, if we can really embrace this technology, um, you know, there's this thing called Jack Trip that they're putting out from Stanford that you know, reduces the latency issues on remote performance and just following all that technology and using it to connect. I mean, there's no reason we can't like as all three of our orchestras play together at some point online at the same time. I mean, I'd love that to happen or just kick it to each other. And there's just, I love the connecting and actually this stuff helps us connect. I don't know that we would be on this. We would never have done this if, if COVID hadn't happened. I mean, I'm just, it wouldn't have happened. We would have thought about it. We would have dug into our own little place and done our thing. 
somebody asked how you get your music out there as an orchestra and things. And I think it's really the co-commissioning helps a lot. Again, we don't want to be in a little bubble ourselves that way and just keep holding on to our stuff. It's really about dialoguing with the composer, recommissioning composers, I think is really important. It's not just one after the other, but keeping in relationships. So those 110 commissions are probably 40 composers, maybe 50 composers. Um, I think that's important because it keeps you in the dialogue at the time. Um, and then this other question about what are you doing about social justice? Well, I mean, I think the most important part is to be, again, authentic relationships with people. And when you're not outreaching and thrusting yourself into communities that have never invited you in in the first place, if you're not in relationship with them, that's where you start. And we, last year, with the Composers Diversity Project, were number one in the nation for women composers and number two with composers of color. And I think, again, it's just the idea, like all of you guys here are, um, knowing the people and having the conversation, which is where it sparks the start. Um, and I, I hope that answers your question. I, if you have more detailed questions, that go ahead and chat it. Did you, I, I, Q, did, did you want to say something about that, the uh, just this period? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, well, in terms of to what we're doing during the pandemic, I mean, I, I think for, for SPCO, I think we're all trying to figure them out and everyone has different parameters in terms of their community and what's allowed and what's made. Um, you know, we, we've been erring on the side of caution in terms of like how big the ensembles can get and, and we're, we're doing it strictly from our hall where we have sort of the digital media capabilities already built in. We invested in that a while ago. So, so we're doing um, every other week, Saturday night, um, broadcast live streams, and then eventually they'll go into the library, which is a free library. And so we're building up the works. We have 50 works now, and we're hoping, you know, by the end of the season, we'll have close to 100 if we keep on doing this streaming every other weekend. So it's more streaming than we've ever done. So we're, we're really excited about that. And our digital media team is working incredibly hard. Because we're doing smaller ensembles, I'm playing a lot less. So, you know, I'm, I'm not playing my first one until the end of October. So I'm, I'm itching to get back and playing with colleagues. I did one rehearsal just to test out the acoustics. But it was an amazing experience just to play with other people. You know, I'm lucky at my family, we all play music. So we we're playing together. And, you know, my kids are young, but we, we have a good time playing and making up music together. So. Um, but we definitely miss a live performance. I totally get it, Wayne, like in terms of, you cannot wait till that day where we actually have an audience and they're, you know, you're able to feel that communal experience. Um, One of the first things that, you know, that happened with me is that in about, after about three weeks, I got a new piece arrived in my inbox from John Musto. He just wrote me a piece. Wow. So then I thought, okay, now I have to learn this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was so nice. I mean, there he was and he never would have written that had it not, everything not just stopped. And I think he just had some time on his hands and thought, you know, let me do this. And so, uh, so you know, very excited to, to, to get to work on that. Um, yeah, Bruce, you know, I, Bruce, I, I was just saying, Alicia, I think you had another excerpt oh. that you were thinking about playing yeah, for, it, for us. Is it queued up or is it, is it ready? Can we access it? I don't know, Q, do you have it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure you get that all the time. I get, am I a lawyer? I, I'm not. Um, I don't know, Aiden, can you tell us? Yes, I have it in a minute. So I can, I can um, tell you about it. So one of the commissions we did was for Erbik Erbik Aurelias. He's a Turkish composer who lives in Houston right now. And he wrote a piece. Um, our season was games people play. And I asked him about games from Turkey and he wanted to write it on Turkish wrestling. And originally the actual title would have been Turkish oil wrestling, but I asked him not to put in the word oil. Yeah, don't Google that. Was that um, a Texas problem? You had a problem with that? Oh, ha, ha. wasting oil. No, um, it was just a little risque. Anyway, um, so he wrote this for two Duval drums that were battling. And um, so, yeah, okay, I'll find the, the link. He can't find the link. Anyway, two Duval drums battling and um, and they had to come in front of the orchestra and do this huge battle. And he actually got in, what's really funny is the pulpit is still there. So he got in the pulpit and did this huge announcement yelling um, in Turkish before it happened. And it, it, I just have a tiny excerpt. Talk, talk about something else and I'll get the thing to aim. <laughs> That's funny. Turkish music. Well, actually, w w one of the things I just wanted to mention is that we have so many interesting Turkish um, composers in America. And I think um, one of the unique things about America is just that we have so many 
composers here from all over the world who have made their home here. And at, of course, you know, in many countries they have folks who are, who are immigrants, composers, but I just, we just have this tremendous resource here of composers who've come and brought their language and who bring it into the orchestral world. And it's something certainly at ACO, uh, we just never run out. There's, there's, ne there's just this endless source of creativity coming to us where people are, you know, trying to fuse some aspect of, of maybe the indigenous music of their own culture uh, with a kind of a Western tradition or, or who are looking inwards or outwards in different, uh, from different perspectives. And um, one, one composer made me think of is Cameron Ince, who, who has been here for, um, which is pronounced Inche in, in Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. who's done lots of wonderful orchestra music. We played one of his pieces with ACO a few years ago. And his sister, Deniz, uh, is a, also a composer. I think she stopped composing, but, but there are many, many great, terrific Turkish composers living in the States. Uh, we did a piece by Mehmet Ali Sanlikal a couple of years ago, who's, uh, who's a, also a wonderful composer who has jazz in his background as well. Was that enough? I've been riffing. I'm riffing here. <laughs> no, no. Turkish no, thing. <laughs> she's ready. She said it's ready. I don't know. Okay, go. Go for it. So this is them battling out in the front. They had to learn a whole new style of drumming. Yeah. Oh, this is so it's uh, at, uh, at, at, at two minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, the video is just not going to be great. Zoom. Um, and and the, the funny part for you composers is I really did it for him. He wanted the oboes all the way to the string, no lip on the reed, and I did it, and you just heard it. Um, but there are very few oboes <laughs> that would put that on record. But um, yeah, so it was, I mean, there's a really, I, the, it, it's an exciting piece you guys should do. It. Did you get any put, uh, blowback from the string players in the front of the section who oh. were getting the, the drum right in their ear? We gave them fancy earplugs. It's all good. Oh, okay, okay, interesting. So, uh, so yeah, so that that also requires a real understanding of balance and uh, um, and a modulating, which part of which you probably have to do in rehearsal. No. Mm. Yeah, every, it was tough. Every yeah. time I see any orchestral setting, I'm I'm wondering where are the trumpets sitting and who's in front of the trumpets. <laughs> I, I see the Joe and the trumpet sections are up to the right, and that's, you know, the good, that's a good place. It's safe. My very first ACO concert, um, a certain string player put a barrier in front of me um, that was like 10 feet tall. And I was just like, are you serious? You know, and I really wasn't playing that loud, but it was just, it was a small stage. But I'm like, come on. But we deal with that all the time. And, you know, we don't, we just, kind of point down or if we're if it's real close you know you're, you're always aware of that but it's uh but sometimes you know those pieces call for us to really go nuts and you just do it and people like okay sounds great you know <laughs> i'm from the band world it doesn't bother me <laughs> yeah 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 it's interesting the band world yeah. well look i i don't want to take I, we, we've been talking for for a while we've heard some some really terrific music and and i know that the audience is appreciative of hearing from three just stellar not only musicians but thinkers and doers in the orchestra world and um thank you for making the orchestra world so much richer with all your creativity and everything you do for composers and for um and for you know moving music forward um in our century um, even at this time, uh, just just hearing what you're doing during the pandemic is inspiring. So, uh, so I, I want to let everybody here know what our next 
few talks are going to be about. Um, we have one, we have a talk on November 9th, which is about fundraising. Oh, joy. Learn about fundraising, how to fundraise for your own projects via supportive individuals. Uh, so learn to leverage the support of generous individuals, of which there are more and more wealthy ones in the States all the time, and, uh, and luckily some generous ones uh, among those very wealthy ones. So uh, we're going to have um, uh, Bonnie Marshall from the American Composers Forum, our good friends who have helped co-sponsor these talks. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nicholas Fahn, the wonderful tenor who does a lot of uh, raising money for his own projects, his own commissions, including a festival that, that he runs. Uh, Daphnis Prieto, the drummer, a wow. uh, fantastic musician uh, who will be talking, and Somi Kakoma, a vocalist and songwriter. So we've got a very diverse panel uh, on November 9th, and then on January 20th, entrepreneurship and ensembles uh, for composers, and how can composers help guide their own careers, moderated by Frank Oteri, who many of you know from New Music Box, uh, featuring Afa Dworkin, who runs the uh, Sphinx organization, uh, Nadia Sirota from Y Music, who is also a great radio announcer, and Sugar Vendel from the Nouveau Classical Project. So, uh, so you the the folks who asked about entrepreneurship and uh, selling your work or getting your work out there. That'll be a nice panel, um, and then uh, finding your voice online. Uh, so this last one, which is on February 3rd, is about how composers can find their true artistic message and convey that online. Uh, Damien Strange is moderating, and uh, our panelists are um, Anthony Green, uh, composer, performer, excellent pianist, and um, founder and uh, musician in Castle Bar Skins in Boston, Mary Prescott. Uh, composer and interdisciplinary artist, and Beth Stewart from Verismo Communications. So uh, those are some of our first ones, and we're going to keep going. This is just volume one. So we're going to go throughout the year. Please join us. Thank you so much to Wayne Dumain, uh, trumpeter extraordinaire, Q Young Kim on the violin, and Alicia Lawyer, uh, oboist, also extraordinaire, and um, from ROCO, from St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, from ACO, NYU, all those good places, lots of other orchestras that you play with, Wayne. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, and, um, and thanks to our audience. And I'm just checking in to see whether there's any last, there are some uh, interesting uh, um, notices in the chat about different organizations that you can, so I'll, so, so please, um, please join us again in the future. Thanks to the American Composers Forum. Thanks to our staff at ACO, especially Aiden Feltkamp, who's been running things yeah. here. Yeah. And I will give you all non-virtual applause, uh -huh. uh, really from the heart. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, ACO. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. I'll applause us out. It's nice to hang out with you guys today. Oh, Billy Lackey from American Composers Forum, also hosting. Thank you, Billy. Okay. Well, that's See you all soon. Bye. Bye.